When the cleanup crew of the newly refloated USS West Virginia opened the hatch to two rooms located deep within the ship's hull, nothing could prepare them for what they would find. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, she'd been submerged underwater for six months, but these rooms were dry. Used batteries and empty rations littered the floor. Fresh water had been accessed via the manhole covers. On the floor were the bodies of three young men, huddled closely together, and near them a calendar with 16 days marked in red from the date of the attack on Pearl Harbor, the 7th of December, 1941, through to the 23rd. They had been trapped in here for 16 days. But that's not the story their parents had been told. Officially, they were supposed to have died manning their battle stations on the day of the attack. The reality? Well. That was something beyond anyone's wildest nightmares. Let's start at the beginning. Most accounts of the night before the attack on Pearl Harbor pretty much say the same thing. The evening of Saturday the 6th of December, 1941, was ordinary. Pleasant, even. The night sky was clear and the air was warm. Now, as part of the United States Pacific Fleet, the USS West Virginia, or the Weavy as she was affectionately known, was one of eight battleships moored in what was known as Battleship Row on Ford Island in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. With around 800 ships, 390 aircraft and some 4,500 marines, Pearl Harbor represented the very pinnacle of American military strength. But in spite of rigorous training, numerous drills and a general belief that war with Japan was probably only a matter of time, no one was on particularly high alert that evening. Deep down, most believe that the Japanese lacked the capacity, or the nerve, to attack such an imposing and important fleet. And so in the ships and around the harbour, things ticked along as normal. Just like everyone else, Ronald Endicott, Louis Costin and Clifford Olds, three young recruits who were about to find themselves trapped in a nightmare, suspected absolutely nothing. They were fairly new recruits and had actually never seen action. After graduating boot camp, all three had found themselves stationed together in the USS West Virginia's engineering department, learning how to service the ship's boiler. Now, it probably wasn't as exciting as firing the ship's monstrously huge 16-inch guns, but it was a respectable job that offered training, progression, decent pay, and of course, adventure. For three boys from small hometowns who grew up in one of the worst economic downturns in US history, joining the Navy was a no-brainer. Ronald Endicott, Louis Costin, and Clifford Olds. These are names you're going to become very familiar with. But before we dive into their ordeal, why don't we get to know them a little bit better? Let's start with Ronald, the youngest. 18-year-old Ronald Endicott, also known as Tubby, was from a small town in Washington. He loved baseball and had a job at a local bowling alley. He was steady, responsible, mild-mannered, and a bit of a romantic. I actually managed to track down this photo of him with his then-girlfriend Velma, as well as a letter she wrote many decades later, where she talked about how head over heels in love they were. When he left his hometown of Aberdeen, Washington, to follow in the footsteps of his father, she was heartbroken. 21-year-old Louis Costin, on the other hand, was a classic extrovert. Impulsive, funny, 
everybody's friend. He wasn't the best behaved kid, but it was really hard not to like him. Whenever his mom would get angry, for example, he'd just grab her and start impulsively waltzing her around the kitchen. He was a typical class clown, but later he matured, and once when he was on leave, he went back to his hometown and actually apologised to his teachers for being such a menace. You're not supposed to have them, his brother would later go on to say, but deep down they all knew that Louis was his mom's favourite. Now, 20-year-old Clifford Olds, the highest ranking of the three, was practically born to be a sailor. He grew up in a prairie town in North Dakota, and he was rough around the edges, always itching for a fight, though due to his size he rarely won any. He liked fishing, motorcycles, and open seas. In front of his friends, he had a hot temper and plenty of bravado, but at the end of every month, he would quietly slip away to send the majority of his wage back home to his mom, because he knew she needed it more than he did. That night, Louis and Ron would most likely have been spending a Monday night aboard the ship. For Clifford, however, the night was just getting started. You see, Clifford was granted authorised recreational leave, also known as Liberty, until midnight, and so he was already on a small boat from Ford Island to the mainland with a few friends who were also stationed on the Weavy. His destination was a place called the Monkey Bar at the Pearl City Tavern. Due to its proximity to Battleship Row, this place had a bit of a reputation and had three things in abundance, beer, monkeys, and sailors. As one sailor once put it, if you wanted to learn to fight, then this was the place to do it. Though this was strictly sailor versus sailor combat and the monkeys were simply observers, with some notable exceptions. At some point in the evening, after a few drinks, a barmaid offered to take the group's picture, to which they agreed only to be disappointed moments later when she tried to sell it back to them for an extortionate price. This was a pretty common scam on the island in those days, and recognising it as just that, they told her to keep it. Luckily, the negative would be retrieved a few weeks later when one of the group realised that it was the last photo ever taken of the 20-year-old Clifford, who could be seen on the far right, smiling and smoking a camel cigarette. In blissful ignorance of what was to come, Clifford made his way back to the ship, underneath the night sky, slightly tipsy. He had no way of knowing the 16 days that would lie ahead of him. None of them did. Yet they were all about to endure something unimaginable and become part of one of the worst stories that I've ever heard. Now, before we tackle how and why these three men found themselves trapped, we need to understand the sheer speed at which this attack happened and how this precipitated the horrifying decisions that had to be made by the people aboard the USS West Virginia that day. These decisions would save the lives of many, but they would simultaneously doom others to the worst fate imaginable. On Sunday the 7th of December, just before 8am, operating in near perfect visibility and wind conditions, the Japanese Navy Air Service carried out the worst naval attack in US history. The Japanese had launched an attack force of 350 planes, the biggest and fastest at-sea launch in the history of warfare. The Japanese forces had actually prepared to be spotted that day, prepared to fight their way to their target if necessary, but for reasons that are beyond the scope of this documentary, the attack itself achieved complete surprise. Those stationed in Pearl Harbor that day were desperately unprepared. Just listen to this statement from the then 18-year-old Richard Fisk. He wasn't scared or confused when he saw the planes approaching, but annoyed. I can just see myself on the quarter deck, and we were talking to one another, and Stanley Bukowski, and we saw these planes, and he was saying, doggone it, he said, we're going to have a, a drill on Sunday. He says, don't they have any consideration for us? This is Sunday. We should be having a drill. We have them all the time. He says, give us a rest. Moments later, Fisk and his friend were sent flying from one end of the ship to the other. This terrifying photo, taken from a Japanese plane right at the beginning of the attack, shows this exact moment. That's the USS West Virginia right there. Shortly after this first impact was felt, the sound to general quarters, an alarm which means get to your stations, action is imminent, resonated throughout the ship. It was a sound everyone was intimately familiar with, a drill they'd practiced hundreds of times. And for a few very brief moments, some entertained the idea that it was an elaborate drill, or even a training mission gone wrong. 
So incomprehensible was the idea that the Japanese were capable of launching such an attack. But then the following words were heard over the speaker system. Japanese are attacking. All hands general quarters. This is not a drill. And just like that, in the middle of eating their breakfast, they were under attack. Like many stationed on the USS West Virginia that morning, senior gunnery officer Lieutenant Claude Ricketts swiftly made his way to his battle station, only to find things weren't quite working as they should have been. Doors were locked, ammunition was inaccessible, and his gun wasn't working. And to make matters worse, due to the ship's outward-facing position on Battleship Row, she'd been hit on her port side and was now beginning to list. And that list was bad. So bad that those whose guns were working were actually struggling to operate them. These factors, in turn, forced Ricketts to make a decision that was far beyond the call of duty. He was going to fix the ship's list by beginning counter-flooding, a process that involves purposely flooding certain parts of the ship to ensure stability, and in this case, avoid capsizing. That'll work, assuming that part of the ship hasn't been completely destroyed, but it did involve Ricketts going back down to the third deck of a partially flooded ship that was now listing 28 degrees to port and was still being actively assaulted in the dark. He knew all of this. And he did it anyway. Now, when Ricketts made his way down there, he was greeted by a number of ship fitters who had all had the same idea. There was just one problem. The handles needed to operate the valves were in a locker and nobody had the key. A number of ship fitters had been hacking away at the locker to no avail. And then, in a moment of desperate, adrenaline fueled fury, one quick-thinking ship fitter, Sylvester Puccio, managed to smash the locker open with a steel crank. Ricketts and the ship fitters got the valves working, and at the very last moment possible, the ship began to right itself, and hundreds of men were able to escape onto the deck, as the ship slowly sank to the bottom of the harbour floor, on an even keel. Now you're probably wondering what this has to do with Ronald, Clifford and Louis, and it's a good question, to which the answer is terrifyingly simple. Ironically, their problem was that the ship didn't capsize. Allow me to explain. As general quarters sounded, the three men made their way to what is assumed to be their correct stations, just as they were trained to. Within a few minutes, the watertight hatch leading to their station, situated deep within the ship's hull, starboard side, was shut. This was most likely done not because they were trying to avoid drowning due to the ship's massive water intake, but more likely because the men were following orders to set Condition Z, a battle closure condition wherein all the ship's hatch compartments are closed to ensure maximum watertight integrity. This was standard practice, and archival material tells us that it was successfully communicated throughout the ship before the power went out. Those orders would have been taken very seriously by everyone on board, in the words of one Pearl Harbor historian, during Set said, every sailor knew fate could place them in a doomed area to be drowned like rats. Old timers would tell 17 and 18 year old boots that if such a time ever came, just inhale water quickly and get it over and done with. This, the grizzled ones claimed, was preferable to a slow death in the pitch black void. He's not kidding. One of the West Virginia's action reports I read told how some men narrowly missed the closure of the hatch to Central Station. As the water began to rapidly rise, they found themselves trapped on the wrong side. Even as they begged, Damage Control Officer Lieutenant Commander Harper refused to let anyone open it. And nobody did. It's a great irony that the very process designed to keep certain things out also invariably locks other things in. Because eventually, as the ship sank down to the bottom of the harbour, the areas around the men's station did flood, and this trapped all three men in a compartment at the bottom of the ship. If only the ship had capsized, then maybe, like some of those on the other capsized battleships, they would have had a chance of being rescued. But their fate was sealed the minute those counterflooding valves began working. And even though they survived the initial attack, they were now at the bottom of a flooded battleship which had sunk 40 feet down into the harbour floor. That might not sound very deep, but for reasons we will come to understand later, I might as well have been on the moon. And this is where our story really begins.
really impossible to know how Ronald, Louis and Clifford felt as the sound of explosions faded and the reality of their situation dawned on them. I imagine relief at having survived the initial attack gave way to terror fairly quickly. These three men had joined the Navy to fight, to be part of something bigger and now here they were, having never even seen action, trapped in two small rooms. The world is indeed comic. But the joke is on mankind. The two rooms that the men found themselves trapped in were rooms A111 and A109. A111 was effectively a supply cupboard. It contained tools and other items needed to service that part of the ship, as well as a clock, a desk and some stationery. In here, the men would have no doubt had access to all the tools they would have ever needed. But food? Probably not. A109 was the fresh water drain and pump room which was for processing seawater and this had two manhole covers and these in turn provided access to fresh water. Now, A109 was most likely their battle station and most stations were fitted with an emergency locker which would have contained flashlights, batteries, a first aid kit and some basic food rations. At least in theory. Anecdotally, it seems that supply lockers were pilfered for spare batteries or an extra ration of this or that. Nonetheless, we know that the men had access to at least some emergency food because, according to official Navy salvage reports, empty rations were found on the floor. And we know that they had access to at least some source of light because they were able to mark a daily cross on the war calendar. How much food exactly, and how many batteries they had to power these lights is impossible to say. Some reports state that batteries were found on the floor, others don't. Either way, emergency supply lockers were designed to last for days, not weeks. The only thing really that can be said with any kind of certainty is that the power on the ship went out fairly early on and it would seem logical that they rationed the use of any batteries and torches, meaning at some point their only light source would need to be switched off. And submerged 40 feet down, surrounded by water on all sides and behind several feet of steel, those rooms would have been dark. If the torches were turned off, and they almost definitely would have been, you wouldn't even be able to see your hand in front of your face. This is a small but important detail, not because absolute darkness is terrifying, but because prolonged exposure to this kind of darkness has a pretty devastating impact on the human psyche. Research shows that when humans are introduced to this kind of rapid visual deprivation, as the literature calls it, it actually doesn't take long for most people to begin experiencing quite clear auditory and visual hallucinations. Exposure to this kind of darkness also understandably tends to make people quite anxious. It causes thoughts to become jumbled. You start to think strange things like, who am I? Is this real? Can I really trust what's in front of me? Is this really happening? Am I really sure, without a shadow of a doubt, that I am, in fact, alone? One psychologist running some very questionable sensory deprivation experiments back in the 50s was surprised at just how quickly people's sense of self began to degrade. Rooms A111 and A109 were hell. Of that much we can be absolutely sure. And so naturally, two immediate questions come to mind here. Why couldn't anyone get in to rescue them? And we'll come to that very shortly. But also, why couldn't they get out? Well, between the hunger and the unrelenting darkness, I'm sure they probably did want out. More than they wanted anything in the whole entire world. But the only way out was to open that watertight hatch, and the rooms were surrounded by water on all sides. The water pressure outside would have been greater than any force that could be exerted by three men. And even if they could have somehow got it open, swimming to the top wasn't a realistic option. The power was out and the USS West Virginia was now a partially destroyed but nonetheless endless maze of corridors and rooms littered with other closed watertight hatches. Even if they wanted to just flood the room to get it over and done with, in the words of the older sailors, they couldn't. There was no way out. They were trapped. And so, to the ticking sound of a Seth Thomas mechanical eight-day clock, they waited. Each day, turning on their torches for an allotted time, marking a cross on their calendar with a red grease pencil, each hour taking turns to scream and bang on the walls as the rations, the light, 
and something altogether much more important ran out. And the world around them continued. The banging noises, at least according to Fisk, were much worse at night. During the day, the harbour was a hive of activity as people scrambled to deal with the devastation all around them. But the nights were quiet and dark. No lights were allowed. Noise was to be kept to a minimum. And somebody had to keep watch. That somebody was 18-year-old Richard Fisk. You heard from him earlier when he spoke about seeing the planes fly overhead just before the first bombs hit. He would be haunted by those noises for the rest of his life. The moon would be out and, and it was a beautiful night, but everything was completely blacked out because there was no light showing or anything. You couldn't show a light. In fact, everything kind of ceased at sunset. And at night it would be so darn quiet and it seemed like that tapping was even more aggravated because of the stillness. Now, I'm sure at this point, you have just one question. If people could clearly hear the tapping, then why couldn't they be rescued? It's a question I've asked a thousand times. As you've probably guessed, it was to do with their location, but there's a little more to it than that. When you read about this story online, it's sometimes accompanied by the general idea that the men were abandoned or ignored because they were low priority and therefore expendable. I've even seen a few instances online where people claim that the men who heard the bangs were given orders to just ignore them. I can sort of understand why you might make this assumption because of course they were far from the only men who had become trapped across the harbour. The thing is, this just isn't really what the evidence points to. Various sources do in fact indicate that the beginnings of a rescue attempt did take place. Divers were on the scene from day one, often risking their own lives in the process. On the day of the attack, one Navy diver recalls how his senior stated clearly that the rescue of any possible survivors takes precedent over every other operation. And if we look at the source material, we are actually able to build up a pretty decent timeline of this rescue. Fisk states that when the bangs were first heard coming from the USS West Virginia on the evening of Monday the 8th of December, 24 hours after the attack, he and his colleagues reported it, but they couldn't be sure exactly where on the ship those bangs were coming from. They just knew that they heard them. Fisk explains. And the bagging continued, so it was getting dark then, and they figured, well, we'll uh, start uh, Wednesday morning. So Wednesday morning, they got some divers, and they went through all of main deck all that morning and trying to find out where the banging was coming from. They couldn't find it. Each day, we could still hear the tapping, and of course, we would bang all over the ship to let the guys know that we are looking for them. This report of a possible banging noise is actually mentioned in an official report by Homer Wallin, the man in charge of the Pearl Harbor ship salvage effort, in the Washington State Archives, dated the 19th of December, 1941. It states that the bangs were reported, but that no one could really be certain where they were coming from. This was far from the end of the rescue efforts though, because on Friday the 12th of December, five days after the men had become trapped, yet more divers were on the scene, that day, they would spend virtually an entire day underneath the water, sounding every accessible part of the ship's exterior by slamming a huge hammer against it and carefully listening for a response within. Except, to quote Navy diver Edward Raymond directly, 200 feet of our hull amidships because the West Virginia was pressed tightly against the side of the Tennessee. This photo was taken on the 10th of December, 1941, three days after the attack and just before the ship was sounded for survivors. You can clearly see the part of the hull that Raymer is referring to. Due to the way she'd sank, a part of the West Virginia's starboard side hull was pressed up against her neighboring USS Tennessee and was completely inaccessible to divers. And wouldn't you know it, this was the location of rooms A111 and A109. So the evidence here seems to tell a pretty consistent story everyone heard the bangs, but due to the way the ship had sank, no one could actually figure out where they were coming from. No one could even begin to attempt a rescue because no one could actually locate the source of the noise. Now, that isn't as dramatic as the men being deliberately sacrificed for the greater good, 
but in its own quiet way. Isn't the truth much more terrifying? Being deliberately abandoned is awful, but never being found. That's the real horror. Now, the curious among you may be wondering, if their location could have been pinpointed, could such a rescue have been possible, in theory? Well, the answer to that is probably also no. For lots of reasons that can all be summarised in this quote from Ryan Szymanski, curator over at Battleship New Jersey. The West Virginia was more modern. Her shell plating covered up another four layers of tanks and void spaces to protect against torpedoes, which meant that anybody trying to cut in would have to cut through five layers of steel, some of which would have held fuel. Obviously, cutting with a torch through steel into a space that's filled with fuel is not a good idea. Now, to be clear, salvage diving teams were taking insane risks to rescue those trapped within, often with terrible consequences, but those divers simply did not have the equipment that modern divers have today. Once those divers entered the interiors of sunken battleships, they were submerged into a world of total darkness. On the first orientation dive into the Weavy after the attack, one highly experienced diver emerged after a few hours and simply shook his head. Twisted metal, bodies, debris, oil, and there was a lot of oil. They had all rendered his headlamp useless. There was zero visibility down there. Patching, draining, and raising the 17,000 ton USS West Virginia would take months, and it would be a miracle in and of itself. Ronald, Louis, and Clifford did not have that kind of time. And so, after a few days, it seems that the perimeter guards just stopped reporting the bangs. At night, as they stood watch in the still darkness of the harbour, they covered their ears. And eventually, the bangs would stop. After months of tireless, backbreaking work, the USS West Virginia, through multiple mind-boggling feats of engineering, was drained and raised. The initial cleanup of the ship, as you can probably imagine, had been like something out of a nightmare. Between the severity of the attack and the fact that the West Virginia had been submerged underwater for several months, bodies, if you could even call them that, were difficult, often impossible to identify. Clean-out operations and graves registration were not duties for the weak of stomach. Nonetheless, in preparation for dry dock and repairs in June 1942, the last body was removed from the USS West Virginia at some point in late May. Or so they thought. In reality, the then 30-year-old Lieutenant Paul Dice and his subordinates within the engineering division were about to walk into a literal nightmare. At this point, several months into the cleanup operations, Dice and his crew probably thought they'd seen and heard it all. Yet nothing, nothing in the entire world would have prepared them for what they found when they opened that hatch. Grown men would break down in tears when they pieced the scene together, and the men's fates would be recorded in the ship's salvage report dated June 15th, 1942. There was evidence that some of the men had lived for considerable periods and finally succumbed due to lack of oxygen. Three bodies were found on the lower shelf of storeroom A111, clad in blues and jerseys. This storeroom was open to fresh water pump room, A109, which presumably was the battle station assigned to these men. The emergency rations at this station had been consumed and a manhole to the fresh water tanks below the pumps had been removed. A calendar, which was found in this compartment, had an X marked on each date from December 7th, 1941 to December 23rd, 1941, inclusive. This scene devastated those who saw it. In the words of Fisk, they kind of changed us. We really weren't the same after that. In the end, they lost their lives to carbon dioxide poisoning. 
This is an awful way to go. I can only imagine the panic and terror that they would have felt in their final moments, in their final days. Those poor men. There is every possibility that the men survive beyond the 23rd of December, but that this was just the last day that they were able to mark the calendar due to either the effects of the carbon dioxide poisoning, running out of light, or both. Now, it's at this point in the story that a couple of questionable decisions were made by those in charge. These choices would have knock-on effects and would change the narrative around these men's deaths for literally years to come. First of all, as the men's belongings were being gathered, Lieutenant Paul Dice took it upon himself to take a few mementos from the scene, specifically the Seth Thomas eight-day clock and probably also the calendar though he would only admit to the former. Secondly, the powers that be decided not to communicate the correct date nor the circumstances of death to the men's families. Instead, they decided that the telegram announcing their deaths that had been sent out in the middle of December 1941 was sufficient. That telegram was standard issue and was the second the families had received regarding the fate of their sons. The first was an immediate and standard missing in action telegram and the first line of the second would have read as follows. After exhaustive search, it has been found impossible to locate your son, and he has therefore been officially declared to have lost his life in the service of his country as of December 7th, 1941. This in turn caused the men's deaths to be announced before they'd actually died. In Ron's case, his sister Shirley and his girlfriend Velma, who I mentioned earlier, went running down to their local paper with the telegram and his pictures to submit his obituary, an entire week before he actually passed. Here it is, dated the 17th of December, 1941. I found it in a library near his old house. This decision by the Navy to not correct the men's date of death and just leave things as they were was probably, if we're not being cynical, seen as a small mercy to the men's families, because a correction to their date of death six months later would inevitably lead to questions. The answers to which they probably felt that the families were better off not knowing. People had seen what had happened in those rooms, and before they'd seen it, they'd heard it. And as we will come to learn, there are some secrets which simply cannot be kept. Three, three minutes after six o'clock on Hawaii 105 KINE. It's 1995. The OJ Simpson trial is making headlines. The general public is now able to easily access the World Wide Web for the first time. And home ownership for young people is actually a reality. Hawaii is a different place now, too. A monkey bar is gone, it's been replaced by a car dealership, and the remains of the sunken battleships are now a popular tourist attraction. In Oahu, a young man had just got his first big break as a staff writer for the Honolulu Advertiser and had been tasked with finding a human interest piece for the paper's annual coverage of the attack on Pearl Harbor. An unenviable task for lots of reasons, not least of which because it's hard to imagine what else can possibly be said 54 years on. Nonetheless, he starts in the most logical place, the Pearl Harbor National Memorial. And it's here he joins a tour with a volunteer who, with tears in his eyes, begins telling a story so harrowing that it silences everyone in the room. It was, in vivid detail, the story of Louis, Ronald and Clifford. In a weathered scrapbook, the volunteer shows the picture of Clifford Olds at the monkey bar to the tour group. People gasp. The volunteer's name, the reporter would come to find out, was Richard Fisk. By now, half a century had passed. He'd lived a full life, become a pilot, fought in Nam and Korea got married, had kids, retired to Hawaii. And through it all, 
He never, ever forgot those three men. How could he? And so he told their story. He told it to anyone who would listen. I've combed through old camcorder footage, newspaper articles, TV interviews, and there are a lot. And the story he tells is always the same. And in a way, what the Navy had taken from these men, the truth, had been given back to them by Fisk. Even though there was a clear discrepancy between Fisk's story and the men's graves, no one had the inclination to take it any further. But that day, the young reporter did have the inclination. Sensing a potential front page piece, he went digging. And what he found was really, really sad. I want to use a better word here, but there just isn't one. He found that because of the way the Navy had chosen to handle the men's deaths initially, their stories had become fragmented. Like I said before, people had been there that day, they had told people about what they saw, and those people had told people, and so on. So when the reporter tracked down the Olds and Costin families, Ronald Endicott's were unfortunately just untraceable, he discovered that some of the remaining siblings did, in fact, know. They'd always known. Because the brothers of Olds and Costin had joined the Navy back in the 40s, and eventually, someone had quietly taken them both aside as a kindness. Better to hear it now, in full, than in passing as other sailors recounted the story in detail over a few beers. The two brothers had been keeping the secret successfully for years, vowing never to tell their parents, nor any siblings they felt would not be able to handle such dreadful news. From the telegram, the families had assumed a quick death in action. That telegram was all they had. In the end, neither Clifford nor Louis's parents ever did find out. And neither would have Louis's now 71-year-old sister had the reporter not told her over the phone. In her own words, the news broke her up. She cried for days. Harlan, Louis's younger brother, can be seen here doing the obligatory photo for the papers. But it's clear that he was devastated by all of this. I just wanted to spare them the grief, he would say to the reporter. Louis's mom would write to the Navy asking for more information, but of course she wasn't given the full story. She wore the watch he bought her just before the attack until the day she died. It was found in his locker when the ship was raised. On top of all of this, it was also discovered that Paul Dice had taken the clock as a memento. He'd, quote, mailed the calendar to the chief of naval personnel in Washington, D.C., but it had, of course, become lost. He didn't have the clock anymore. He told the reporter that in 1989, he suddenly was overcome with a wave of guilt and decided to give the clock to a museum. This is, in fact, only a half-truth. In reality, he sold it to a private collector who displayed the clock alongside other weavy memorabilia in the corner of an architectural business in Parkersburg, Virginia. Like an episode of Black Mirror. There it sat for a decade, where presumably the awful story could be told to anyone who wanted to hear it. Thankfully, it was eventually donated to the West Virginia State Museum, and that's where it remains. Eventually, after writing the article, the reporter moved on to bigger and better things. And aside from a few articles here and there, and a Reddit post every year or so, the men's ordeal remained an obscure horror story, the precise details of which are known by only a few. But curiosity got the better of me, and so I did a little digging myself. After the article had been published back in 95, I found that an ex-serviceman, now journalist, named Don Haynes had been working alongside the men's families to help them get the date of their brother's headstones officially changed. They even went as far as to make contact with the Department of Veterans Affairs, and the official response, if I'm reading it correctly, seemed to be a bit of a runaround and, in the end, amounted to nothing. The date of death inscribed on the headstone is based on the date of death listed on the individual's death certificate, they said and this can only be changed by the Department of the Navy. When he got in touch with what was supposed to be the correct department, they politely told him that they did not maintain copies of death certificates from this era, and that they regretted that they were unable to provide more assistance. And then the chain of correspondence stopped. Don tells me that they tried to take it further, but were unable to. Fisk had passed, and the physical piece of evidence, the calendar, wasn't in the official archives. The men are mentioned in various archival material here and there, but never by name. The Navy really, really didn't want the families to find out. 
But the truth is, this decision has fundamentally affected the way in which this story has been told. When I made contact with Don Haynes a few months back to make this documentary, he told me that he'd felt like he'd let the men's families down, and that he really hoped, more than anything, to help make it right by at least getting their real date of death officially acknowledged. Over the years, he'd been collecting everything he could get his hands on about these three men. Letters, photographs, news articles. He sent me everything, without hesitation. He's adamant, vehemently so, that Louis, Ronald and Clifford deserved more than a purple heart and an incorrect date on their tombstones. His words, not mine. I'll send you everything I have, he wrote in one email. Maybe you can finish what I started. Give them the coverage they deserve. Just tell the story right. I told him I would do my very best. Thank you.